Uh, still Groningen, the Netherlands. No, I had to go to Finland for a uh, congress uh, or festival for startups and investors to see if we could get some more investors on board for our uh, different ventures. Interesting. Not just necessarily the, the tabletop game that I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about. Yeah, definitely part of the package, though. Uh, we actually got our first investor last week, um, coincidentally. Uh, uh, congratulations. Um, which, thank you. It's just uh, of all the, the projects I've ever done, I never expected to be a pen and paper role playing game uh, to be the first that got an investment. But hey, you know. <laughs> just, where, where is your background originally? Where do you come from in terms of this process or this, this thing that you're working on? Um, well, that's uh, well. When it comes down to uh, the Aether Void project, uh, I've been a pen and paper role playing uh, role player since I was eight. I started eight. with, uh, yeah, yeah. That's quite young, I guess. Yeah, I did. Same as me, um, actually. Back for me, it was D and D. What was your first? Uh... Uh, for me, it was uh, uh, well. The, it was a Dutch translation of a German role-playing system, which is called the Schwarze Auge, and the Dutch version was called Oog des Meesters. Okay. Um, <laughs> some some of the U.S. guys uh, and girls might know it uh, as well because there has been a series of computer games made of it back in I think the the nineties, called I think the the Realms of Arcania. Um, oh, I know this name. I did not play this game though, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it is famous, isn't it? It, it? it is pretty good. It's very buggy, though. Uh, but oh, this, is our, <laughs> this is the yeah. 90s, right? Everything was buggy then. Yeah, I, I think they actually tried to patch it by uh, sending floppies after or it's two clients that bought it so they could patch it with a new floppy. It was crazy, but yeah. <laughs> so there's a new incarnation of it out now, I think. Realms yeah. of Arcana. Yeah, the, it's yep. on Google Play. Yep. They made remakes. Yeah. So uh, this they, they is what you cut your teeth on. Yeah. Say again, please. I'm sorry. I thought you were pausing. What, what, what were you saying? Oh, I think maybe I should kill the video so we have more bandwidth for audio. Oh, please. Yeah, you're you're welcome to cut off the video. There's nothing I need to. Uh, I'm not even. I'm pacing back and forth. <laughs> We've got a whole ocean between us. That's true. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So let's see if we have a bit better audio quality now. Um, I could also check if I can get on a better Wi-Fi point, but I think this is the best one I can get on right now. So let's just hope it's good this way. You sound okay to me. Do I do I sound okay to you? I'm not breaking you up or anything. Do you think this is the delay or whatnot between us? It's, it's, it's better now that I killed the video. And I also think the lag is a, a bit better, uh, a little less now. So that's good. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's something you have to be aware of with this kind of platform is there's just tends to be a little bit of problem every time. But unfortunately, like we were, I was just geeking out about the fact that we get to talk over such a vast distance about yeah. games. I mean, it's like nonsense. It's so cool. So um, eight years old, you're playing this game. Is it dice? You roll dice for the game that you're what you started out with? Yeah. 20 yeah, all that stuff. On, 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 yeah, definitely. It was based on a D20 and D6s. So you had a okay. D20 for attacking and defending and for skill checks. And it was D6s for uh, weapon damage and such. I think actually the game was a big success in Europe because uh, at the time D&D was not translated to European languages. That's what I think. I'm not sure about this. Well, so I was going to ask, yeah. Have, have you ever had an opportunity to, to give, your, um, give D&D a shot? Yes. You're, yes. What do you I was late to the party. You were late. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I started D and D probably well uh, somewhere in my thirties at some point. Okay. Um, and then three point five. Um, still playing three point five. Um, a lot of purists you know, think that's are... the best one. <laughs> I think it's the best one yeah. too. I've played a bunch of them. Actually, if you can get somebody hardcore enough to run you through like the original Dungeons and Dragons, the red box version, you know, before it was number, you know, before <laughs> the incarnations, and that one's a lot of fun if you're willing people. I think so too. I think the, the, there is a certain beauty in in the first version where uh, in, in some ways it's simpler and that makes it faster to play as well. Um, yeah. Permadeath. I mean, we. I've only played it a few times. It's really hard to find somebody who knows how to kind of DM those situations, but you die. I, mean, I just kept dying, re-rolling characters. 
So um, how does your game, I mean, how close are you to having an engine? I mean, do you have mechanics and all that good stuff or gameplay already in place? We, we have, uh, we have a, a gameplay engine in place already. Um, so we, we came up with a whole system. It features something that we call um, the Trinity system and the body, mind and soul system. This is the names we've given it. Um, so the Trinity system refers to that we basically say whenever you do something, it's based on nature, nurture and uh, chance. And every third of those m- makes up the whole of whatever you do. Um, and then the body, uh, m- mind and soul system basically divides your attributes over these three categories. And that's my youngest daughter singing in the background. <laughs> no I problem. It's not disturbing. <laughs> I've got a daughter too. They like to scream. Yeah, they can. <laughs> so, uh, so we have an engine in place. We tested it uh, quite extensively internally for the last couple of months. Um, we did several play tests and found that for skill checks and uh, combat, it's doing quite, quite well. It's quite fast when playing. It's still quite tricky to make characters in it, but it is very easy to play once you have a character. And then uh, we have a lot to tweak when it comes down to the magic system. The magic system, the first time I think one of our characters just blew out a whole section of a tower wall a- along with uh, them foes. So you're a little bit overpowered, cool. basically. Yeah, a yeah. little bit, yeah. <laughs> So that's fascinating. So as far as game mechanics go, you say the combat system is in place 100%. Yeah. Yes. How does combat work? Yes. And this- can, can you go over? I mean, actually, it's really interesting to me how you even develop something like this, right? Because, I mean, when you look at D&D or even like uh, Realms of Arcana, there, there is an engine at play. Do you take these games into consideration when you start building your, your engine up? and then tweak them yes, to make it better? Definitely. Or do you try to start from scratch? So you, you use something that's already existing, well, basically. Uh, we started from scratch, but with so many role-playing games out there, um, even if you start from scratch, you will end up with something that will resemble some of the games out there. Because it's logic, right? Them. It's math. I mean, how yeah, is, what's, exactly. what's, what's it based on? What are you building your concepts on when you develop an um, engine like this? Well, uh, of course, we, we base it um intuitively on games we've been playing so for example i've played the uh, well realms realms of arcania so to speak i've played um middle earth role playing back in the 90s and um role master and space master by iron crown enterprises i played paranoia uh, uh vampire the masquerade i play vampire um, i've played vampire it's an awesome game it's one of the best yeah, I really liked um, it a lot. It disappeared, didn't it? It died quick, real quick. I remember it being well, popular for yeah. a few years. Um, it's a pity. I mean, they came up with this this new uh, revamp of Vampire, which I, I don't know. I think everybody that liked Vampire: The Masquerade was kind of like, why why come with a revamp if we all still want to play this version? Is there a big community still for vampires? Um, over here, it seems that almost every person I meet that has done some role playing has at least played it or is playing it. And we're about to start a new campaign here with a couple of guys, uh, because it's just awesome to play it in your, in the city where you live and call it, you know, like, uh, in your case, New York by night and, you know, all the hangouts in real life, but then it's the dark version of the world and it's just a wonderful way to geek out with the places you know. I mean, New York City definitely is a perfect playground for vampires. Are you, are you in Amsterdam? I don't know where in the Netherlands you are. Where in the Netherlands are you? Well, we, we're in a town called Groningen, um, and part of us, uh, our team is actually from a, uh, another town called Leeuwarden. These are two uh, small cities in the north of the Netherlands. Oh, okay. um, Amsterdam considers us to be foreigners, pretty much, um, <laughs> and which is funny because the Netherlands, every other country thinks like, how can you call a city that's only two hours away uh, a foreign place? <laughs> But uh, <laughs> it's it's these cities uh, in the Netherlands are pretty good for for Vampire the Masquerade because there is a lot of old city centers with uh, buildings dating back to under 300, sometimes 400 years. Um, so you have all this history, um, and that works really really well because then of course you can have characters that have been living there for 400 years. Um, yeah, it's nice. <laughs> 
So tell me a little bit about the world that you're building up around your engine. So yeah, so when it comes down to the engine, we, we picked uh, the, the, the best things of the games that we've played. I mean, you know as well that if you play Vampire, there might be some things about it that kind of irk you. You feel like, well, it's a great game, but this doesn't feel balanced or this doesn't feel good. And everybody knows with D&D which elements don't feel balanced or well uh, done in 3.5. Um, I don't know about 5 where that's how that is, but we all have our little annoyances so building your own game is an opportunity to you know take away those annoyances and see if you can somehow fix something that a really awesome team of game developers uh, apparently could not fix at the time uh-huh. of course when you fix these things you probably introduce new issues right and this is usually you're gonna get works. somebody somebody's gonna be annoyed by something that you do can you go yeah. like because we already share game uh, vampire masquerades in 3.5 maybe can you pull out some of the things that bothered you about those those particular engines um, and math wise vampire when you are a really high end vampire if you have skills in, uh, um, in, into the 10 in dice pool wise something strange happens where um, even though you are the absolute master in your skill you still have an insane amount of chance of failures and as you have a really big dice pool you not just have uh, uh, one chance at failure you have 10 chances at failure um, so oh, so so that means that in a you're way, only rolling six sided dice too right so a failure is like one through three or something how does that work can you i think in vampire in vampire if i remember correctly you, you use d10s and okay. so if you have a 10 if, if you have a dice pool of 10 dice i think um that means you have per dice a one out of 10 chance of watching it now, of course, you also have oh, a one okay. out of ten chance. You also have a one out out of ten chance of having uh, um, uh, what is it called again? I think when you do it really critical well in vampire. The critical. I don't yeah, know what it's called success. in vampire. Is it critical? Success? Okay. Yeah. I think that's across um, the board. And, Everybody and, says critical. <laughs> And that by itself is kind of balanced. No matter how big your dice pool is, you will yeah. always have the equal chance for a botch or a critical success. Um, but the moment you increase the difficulty, let's say to difficulty 10, um, that's when things get weird. So Vampire doesn't work when you power play, uh, or at least the math doesn't hold up anymore. There's there's a little glitch in there. And it you almost never, you almost never have to worry about it since most players and npcs will never reach these heights but yeah. at some point we did and we yeah we were a little bit bothered with it um, I mean, you can manufacture the characters too to be at that level also if you wanted to build a level 10 character or whatnot would naturally be that powerful yeah. but it breaks down the role-playing yeah. aspects as well too doesn't it to have an all-powerful character D suffers Absolutely. from that as well the god syndrome basically Yes, yes, we don't like the God Syndrome um, because we like flaws, we like beings being imperfect. Um, and as such, we, what we're going for for Aether Void is it's going to be quite realistic when it comes down to combat, meaning that if you are being attacked by a guy with a sword and you could die from a couple of stabs, and that's something that is going to be very, very different from D&D point, uh, 3.5, where if you, for example, level, level 7 and you're a tank, you can probably take like 50 hits before you die. That's something that always does bother me about all these type of games, though, is the damage, right? I mean, as somebody who's had damage inflicted upon him, that stuff lasts a really long time. I mean, you pull a knee you pull a hamstring you do something bad it's going to last for weeks and you're going to get stabbed by something that doesn't heal overnight yeah and the games just don't satisfy that itch that i have as to what injuries are actually taking place you know you play world of warcraft or everquest or something like that these characters are taking punishing punishing blows i know and i want more of an explanation as to what's happening and why they're able to get up after that fight and walk away yeah, and actually, in computer games, it it it's rather easy to implement this because you have a computer doing all the calculations. When it comes down to pen and paper, you have to sort of find a balance between realism and uh, it still being fast, snappy, and fun to play. Uh, Playability, yeah, is what I was going to say. Yeah, so we wanted to have a stamina drain during battle because we just would really love the idea of these two guys fighting each other and halfway through the fight, they get winded and at some point... Yeah, they, that's cool. They get, that's that would be. Don't really make awesome sense, man. They, 
Yeah, they, they try to lift their sword and they try to bash the other, and they almost can't stand up anymore. And at some point, one guy just falls over from uh, falls over from ex exhaustion. Muscle failure. And, yeah, mean, if you, you have know, a guy in a we, bunch we, of we, armor. I watched a video on YouTube not too long ago. It was like a contest between a medieval knight. I don't know how they constructed the armor or something, you know, how accurate it was to being a medieval knight racing against a soldier in modern technical or tactical armor. And then a firefighter going through whatever a firefighter wears. And the medieval knight actually made it through the fastest out of everybody, wow. even though he was wearing absolute metal. That. Wouldn't expect that exactly. It was a no. YouTube video, so it's hard to say whether or not that was kind of weighted to end up like that. But um, I mean, it's not like out of their own possibilities that they're going to fall flat on their face through exhaustion. I mean, they're doing so much physical stuff in a fight. I know you're, you're swinging uh, uh, like uh, several feet of metal, weighing several pounds. Um, and how much and does this sword weigh? Time? Like ten pounds. <laughs> if you've been yeah, to a gym. I'm, I'm, I mean, a sword fight in armor would probably be like like doing aerobics, but then with heavy weights attached to your body. It it should be insane. Um, right. So we had this this stamina drain in place, and it worked well. But together with hit points and aether points, which we call our points for magic, we also have a willpower drain, which I really liked in Vampire the Masquerade. So that's something that we. Um, got inspired by and then also having a stamina drain and then having to track all these figures manually on your character sheet during a fight it just became uh more of a contest who's best in bookkeeping rather than a contest in who is best in playing the game so we had to right i mean that's the thing isn't it you have realism versus playability can you play it and does yes. it feel real that's the big balance isn't it because i'm interested i want to play the game that you're talking about because i was like thinking willpower shouldn't that be backwards because when you're going into a fight you're kind of scared you don't know what's going to happen what's the other guy going to be like yeah midway through a yeah. fight you're going to be a little bit more filled with you know <laughs> what is it motivation to finish because you'll understand what the fight's about and potentially have a plan well, on this winning. This is a funny thing now, now that you mention it because we have things in store for when it comes down for fear effects and these kind of things because we we um, like to base a lot of things on science with a void and when it comes down to a, let's say somebody would do a classic D&D &D fear spell on you and you would get scared yes. now in D&D &D, the, the game must pretty much say just describe how hard you run away and that's what you do um, well we use the, um, the the four F's the from psychology which would be the, the fight, uh, flight, freeze or and then I'll just be polite say um, and um, as a character, when you design your character, you have to choose what the coping me mechanism is for your character when they are in fear. How, how do they cope? Will they run away? Will they freeze? Or will they end Fight harder. Yeah. excited? Fight more stupid, too, sometimes, you know, when you're afraid. It's, it's yeah. so interesting. I mean, I want the options. I want the variances. I want the things that are happening to the character in combat. And the problem is, though, if it becomes popular, you have eight people playing around the table, a round can last hours. You know what I mean? It's like... Yes. Yes. So, this, this is... You are working on a tabletop game in a world in which modern technology allows us to have tabletops across the world. Are you working on technology to allow people to get together to play this game over vast distances as well? Um, that's, that's, well, we, we thought about this, but, um, what is more likely is that we probably will at some point contact roll 20, um, and roll 20. Yeah. Because in a way, I think that's currently one of the best platforms for remote playing, if utilized properly. So tell me about a, a session. What would be, we've already rolled our characters. I definitely want to handle character creation because that's like my favorite part of, of the whole tabletop thing. But as far as like, okay, we get together, we have our characters. How's a game work? Well, in, in a sense, it works pretty much as every role-playing game. You have a, a, a game master, which we call the Void Master, because, you know, you, you have to have your own original name for this. Um, <laughs> dungeon Master, for obvious reasons. And end up uh, being called the Dungeon Master anyway, because that's what they're all called, right? I know. Or the know. Game Master. Game but, Master yeah. bothers me, honestly. And you call him a Game Master, it's like, no, it's a Dungeon Master. That's how old school yeah. I am with the Dungeon <laughs> It's like, no, it's a Dungeon Master. So Sorry, that's, man. That's exactly what's going to happen. We have to call it Void Master master everywhere in the book because you know dungeon master is most definitely a DD thing uh, and everybody will call it the dungeon master anyway and that's fine that's all good um 
so and and of course they will prepare a session either a session that uh was available in one of the books that we made or a session that they made up themselves um and you, you play just like any other role-playing game so they they sketch out the scenario saying what what the area looks like where you are what is happening and then from your perspective roles you can choose how to respond choose your own action um my favorite part of uh, dnd is the minis you know, getting them and painting them and, you know, having them, my individual touch on the, on the game board. Are you going to uh, do the map thing or is it more a theater of the mind? I think this, this for a part should be up to the dungeon master um, um, and, and their, their party on how they prefer to do it. But um, we definitely at some point want to come up with maps and figures, uh, figurines, all these kind of things. Um, I, I think everybody that really likes role playing at some point has been buying figurines and painting them. Um, we also are thinking of doing something like allowing your figurines to be 3D printed or something like that, or uh, in any way have them, you know, where you can design them on the computer and you can physically get them. Uh, something like that. We, we'll have to see. But for now, we'll focus on the, the, the actual paper products and give people a way to play it with the theater of the mind until we can get into actual deals with figurine manufacturers and the and the likes and what world are we playing in is it a well, fantasy that's, world that's or like, it's good that you asked that because this this is where where we decided to uh do something that we feel is our unique selling point um I mean, everybody has played a fantasy version or a sci-fi version or, or whatnot. And so our premise is basically what if you would have a fantasy world, a science fiction world, and a steampunk world in the same physical universe? So Aether Void will come out in three versions. Uh, one called Farhaven, which is the name of the fantasy planet. One called Sleeping Dragon, which is the science fiction planet. And um, one called Victoria, which is the steampunk planet. Um, so these are in the same physical universe, and you can choose which flavor you like for starters. But the beauty is because they are in the same physical universe, uh, you can travel from one planet to another so on far haven if you are far advanced enough as a player you might eventually end up taming a dragon and a dragon in far haven is capable of star flight and you might go to one of these other places now on victoria you might be a mad scientist making a pact with a demon that can transport you to the other planes meaning the other planets and on sleeping dragon you can uh, go on a rogue mission um, go hunting orcs on far haven to mount them on your wall this is a really important aspect of this type of game, the world, right, that you're playing in, the world building aspects of it. Um, do you yes. feel a lot of pressure? I mean, oh my God, it's hard, right? I mean, you have, how nuanced can you get? Well, um, I think our team is bubbling with ideas for all these worlds and, and for especially also the crossover concept. Uh, we don't find it hard to come up with, um, with worlds, with characters and these kind of things. But um, I do think that, uh, for example, Dungeons & Dragons is already uh, on its fifth edition. That means that it went through its paces. It has a brilliant team of developers and designers and of storytellers. And also we have been spoiled by wonderful books and movies about fantasy themes, science fiction themes and whatnot. So um, of course we we think that we 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 we, cr we are creating some rich and interesting worlds that will appeal to most uh, of these role players. Um, but of course the stakes are high and and well in a way people are a little bit spoiled. Um, yeah they are and and we will just try to spoil them again. So uh, it's interesting, right? Because you're running up against something that I would run up against as an author. Um, do you write fiction yes. as well? Yes. Yeah. So you understand that from that aspect as well. I mean, you've got to be original with this type of stuff. They, we can't cookie cutter, cookie cutter it anymore. I mean, J.K. Uh, J.R.R. Roll, uh, you know, what's his name? Uh, Tolkien, who did the original Middle Middle Earth trilogy. Yeah. I mean, this guy really kind of set the groundwork for us fantasy writers, Absolutely. science fiction writers. 
Absolutely. And, and, and the, the, the most difficult thing as a fiction writer is that um, the internet brought everybody close together, which is awesome. Like you and I are talking now across the Atlantic. Um, and at the same time, it opened up um, the world for everybody's opinion, but also everybody's work of fiction. So uh, everybody that wants to be a writer can be a writer and can publish their writing on whatever website they want. Um, so the competition um, all of a sudden feels so much bigger and larger as well since everybody in the world can compete now. Yeah. How do you stand out? What do you do that makes yourself a little bit different, right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then, talk to um, and then Nicholas the Ames. Did you read uh, The Kings of the Wild? No, not you, yet. It's really, it's a really interesting book. But what got him noticed by agents and, and publishers and whatnot is that he went with this music theme throughout. I read the book. I didn't notice it because I am a gamer. So I took it from like the gamer motif. But he said the reason he got published is that he had this rock and roll thing going on throughout this entire novel. It's just one tiny that thread is. of a theme. And that's what popped for him. It's a typical fantasy novel. That's otherwise, you know what I mean? It's about wizards and warriors and owl bears and whatever have you. I mean, it's everything generic. He said himself he got the monsters from the monster manual. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, that's how original he was. That's inspired by, I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. is, isn't pretty much all the work of uh, Raymond Feist based on probably Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, I think in his opening words for his first book, Magician, he, he mentions that uh, um, I mean, his chemia was created by him and his fellow role players. Yeah. I mean, that's right. I mean, when I play, I want that stuff, right? I don't really want to be yeah. confused with something new. Do you, when you play a role playing game, what do you want? Do you want to feel, what do you, I just ask period. I mean, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's a tricky thing. So for example, for our fantasy worlds, we have elves, we have orcs, um, we have dryads, we have, uh, Lamia. Do you feel pressure to make them different? Do you have to be original with them or can um, they be what they are with their mythology within we, your world? We didn't feel pressured, but we did decide to make one of the race is somewhat different in some aspects because we want players to still experience sort of um, have this mystery where they feel like this is an elf but wait it's not exactly an elf it's just there's something off about this elf so elfish culture on our world has some interesting things that have not been seen before in fantasy yet um, and the same goes for the orcs and the same goes for the dryads so so yes they are dryads they are orcs they are elves but stay tuned because you you might like what you see or not of course i mean we'll probably piss some people off anyway so like <laughs> well, yeah you got not? elves and you made them worse everybody in modern yeah. age is looking for a reason to be mad honestly that's what my opinion is uh, <laughs> um and then the world is in a great place there's a lot to be mad about all you have to do is like close your eyes and spin open you'll find something right in front of you to be mad about um it's interesting so i mean you you had you felt that there needed to be obviously i mean you're working within these separate these uh these these genre worlds i mean they're you're building it yourself you can't take from things you have to create it on your own but you are also from the netherlands do you pull mythology from from your own culture or do you feel because i mean witcher was huge and that's all based on like eastern european myth and lore and yeah, stuff yeah it's it's, it's uh, i think it's polish isn't it um yeah polish the, yeah the polish fantasy writer he uh used a lot of of uh, fantasy well the, the netherlands is an interesting little country it is you know conquered by so many nations in the past i think at one point we were conquered by the spanish then we were conquered by the french we've been conquered by the english we've been conquered by the germans um the, it's you know the first people living in the netherlands probably were a germanic culture that had a pantheon of gods like the vikings and like like the celts uh probably um then the romans came and they brought their pantheon and then they became christians uh so there was one god it's it's i wouldn't say there is it's, really it's a little a bit different you know what I mean? Like if you take yeah. if you take dwarves, which I'm I'm a big fan of the dwarf. I play dwarves and everything. If you look yeah. at a German dwarf and then you look at like a you know a Norwegian dwarf, they're different. They're subtly different things. Yeah, yeah, that's true. 
and then 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 you go to the Netherlands and they go like, what dwarf? <laughs> once a dwarf with the Netherlands what? I think sometimes I feel we're a nation of entrepreneurs that just want to do business and forget about that's, a, that's what's so cool about the Netherlands right it's the biggest shipping empire in the world still presently I think something like that number one number two something like that like huge shipping and since very beginning of time I think always there were boats in in the Netherlands pulling goods out well, or bringing uh, goods in there is definitely something to be said about, uh, I mean, I, for example, I think also using ships, we were the first allowed to trade with Japan uh, and we did so peacefully instead of, so 400 years ago, we were assigned a small island where we were allowed to set foot, but only on that island, not on Japan. Um, and there we could trade with the Japanese. Um, so, so there has definitely always been this trading spirit, but at the same time, the Dutch are also um, what we call very Calvinistic, um, when, probably because the Calvinistic form of Christianity at some point played a big role in the Netherlands. And it kind of makes a lot of people act like, why don't you just act normal? Because that's crazy enough. <laughs> <laughs> what, no, what, what did Calvin do exactly? I don't remember my history, my my Christian religion history. What did, what did sure Calvin either. do? I'm not sure either, but I I um I think it was a very sober uh, sober form of uh, Christianity. I've been to the Netherlands twice in my life, and sober is not how I would describe that experience either time. And <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um. <clears throat> So world building, yeah, man, that stuff is stressful trying to get it. How many people are on your team? We are with six people at the moment, and we have a couple of people that we sometimes consult with. So pretty soon we will, for example, be consulting um, a Chinese friend of one of the team members because Sleeping Dead Dragon is heavily based on um, Chinese and other Asian uh, countries, if you would extrapolate them into 400 years into into the future oh, so I like it. We, need, we need to investigate asia you like know, blade runner right in a way yes yes blade runner was definitely a big inspiration for that world in many ways um but also in a way star trek has been an inspiration for that world um maybe a little Battlestar galactica we have at least seven more worlds ready to be created after these three are launched. Um, we 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 have we have definitely also a world that is somewhat inspired by Star Wars and Firefly because those two franchises would go really well together if you mix them up properly. Um, so yeah, it's it's a fun playground when you set a universe and say we have many inhabited planet planets and they can all be a different genre. I would like to see them all mixed up too, right? I mean, I want to be able to see, you can go to the fantasy planet and you're going to get your ass kicked by magic users, even if you're the most high tech alien in the entire universe. I like that. Yes. I like that you can go to steampunk where they just completely ignore normal rules or easeability of technology and they just have things functioning off of coal or whatever. I don't know how steampunk works really. I don't think I've ever, I, I, I really like the idea of the science fiction world though. Um, that's cool stuff, man. How, how do character building, how does character building work for your game? Ah, oh, yeah. So character building, um, you, you mean actual character creation in the game or when we design NPCs and such? Well, that's day zero, right? So we're going to get together. We're going to play your game. How do we build yeah. a character? Well, of course, um, well, we have decided on, you can choose from three different ways of throwing the dice. Um, one is the standard way, two are optional ways. And uh, the standard way is uh, you roll several d20s per attribute. So you get a score ranging from one to a hundred. Uh, and where one is really, really, really horrible and a uh, hundred is really, really good. Uh, so every attribute is a percentage, basically, from nothing to perfect uh, um, and um, basically you roll 6d20 and the, the worst d20 you can take out that leaves you with um, a number going from not exactly from 1 to 100 but from 5 to 100 so you will be a little above average because of taking out the worst die and because of um, um, if you throw one on each you will still be a little bit higher than one 
Um, because of course, as a as a player, you want to be at least slightly uh, better than the average human being. You want to evolve into a, a hero. You, you don't want to be a nothing from the get go. But but in I'm min max every you... single time. I'm min max. You want me? I'm like a paladin with a like a twenty <laughs> ot, ot strength and like a three intelligence every single time. I'm so dumb about it. <laughs> I think that's inherently like a big weakness with role playing games, right? That I, I'm able to do that with this guy. There's no way in the world well, that a, a guy with an intelligence of three is going to end up with a 20 strength. It's going to end up in a gutter yeah. way before that. Strength yeah. builds up. So to that we really feel that in this case, we would like role-playing games to be more realistic. And that's where, where we also come in. So some things you want to do in Aether Void might have strength restrictions, might have intelligence restrictions. Basically, we say if you have an intelligence of, of, of 30, for example, and you want to you wanna solve a math equation, we can say you can roll all you want, but you will simply never solve this. Even if you have a brilliant ID, it will just be a brilliant wrong ID. So um, we we really don't want these weird situations that leave you nagging when something happens to your character that you feel wasn't just right, but the rules allowed it. So the the the, the, the dungeon master says it happened. Too bad for you. So would you say that re realism plays a big part in, in the character development process? You want real yes. characters just with slightly yeah. above average stats? Yes. Yes. So we have implemented several things to achieve this. Um, in, in a sense, we have something that's a crossbreed between a class system and a classless system. That sounds weird, but uh, to appease people that like classes, we have a couple of builds readily available that they can play from the get-go. They can uh -huh. just copy that character and play as, let's say, a mage or as a fighter or as a rogue. You know, the standard classes that everybody knows from every role-playing game. But uh, effectively, our game allows you to create custom classes really easily. And we do this with something we call subclasses. So you can train several sub places uh, classes with your starting xp um and for example your your subclass could be a uh, fireman uh, and your your fireman could range it, it would have a score from between one and ten points and if you have six points in fireman then you're above average as a fireman um and what the subclass entails is that any skill you would feel is the default skill set of a fireman you have by getting that subclass so you don't have to have a whole sheet full of skills to track them all. No, you just have the subclass fireman that you add with the right attribute for your role. Then you roll a dice and that together is your score for your fireman skill check. How, how long, how many um, subsets do you have like that? Um, we, we come up with a list of um, subclasses that people can choose from if they don't want to think of their own, but we encourage players to come up with their own subclasses. So if we forgot the subclass village drunk and you want, really want to have the subclass village <laughs> drunk, then you have to probably have some fiery debate with your void master about um, uh, um, uh, what would be the standard skill set of a village drunk because he would probably Jackie have Chan, some man. strange skills. Jackie Chan. Yeah, I know. Extreme flexibility, so, you know, pain tolerance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as such, uh, we designed it so that eventually your character can end up having multiple subclasses. So a character could have started as a caravan guard, which could be one subclass. And then at some point, he comes across a magic user and he notices this, that he can train magic and he becomes a mage, having the subclass caravan guard and the subclass uh, mage. And maybe later on, he'll learn a new profession and he might actually have three subclasses. How long does it take you to get more skills? as you play that can that can take some time um for, for people that are impatient you can also choose to specialize in s single skills but xp wise this is not recommended um though um i think i don't have the numbers ready because we recently tweaked it in the last after the last internal play sessions but if i'm correct um Roughly in one session, you can earn up to 10 XP. Uh -huh. And for 10 XP, you might train a single skill in one point. Um, whereas if you want to train one point in a subclass, you would have to play several sessions. So you're not going to be level 20. You're going to be better skilled in a variety of different things and professions. Yes. 
that'll help you in the yes. world completing quests or whatnot. Can um, do you have space travel, sky yes. travel, stuff like that? That's so freaking cool. And what kind of classes are there going to be? Not necessarily a major rogue. You said that you're going to be something kind of reminiscent of that in those separate worlds. Well, um... Uh, the steampunk and the uh, uh, fantasy world for Haven and Victoria, they have their own s different magic systems, which, uh, by the way, are still based on science. Um, and um, this is something very cool that, that, that we've been working on. We have come up with pseudoscientific theory on why uh, um, magic should work on Far Haven on Victoria. We're not going to share it because magic should be mysterious. You should not know why it works. Uh, um, but behind but the scenes, you do have a reason why it works. Yes. Yeah, but you're yes. not going to share it with um, me. Which, of course, <laughs> you're not well, going to tell me. Uh, we want players... Yeah, if you're going to play sci-fi and you're going to end up on a fantasy world and you don't believe in magic and all of a sudden magic happens, this is going to be a culture shock, right? Yeah. You're going to have some so, negatives happening. So we want players. I mean, in, in we have a big storyline for how the, the worlds will evolve and uh, how it's going to build up to a certain climax. Um, and if at some point in the sci-fi world, we'll at some point be in touch with the Forhaven and Victoria and we'll start researching what is this magic thing how can it possibly work and what is it and we want players to have the chance to maybe design a researcher character that actually starts researching it so we don't want to spoil it by already presenting our magic science theory I, I love it and I love that I see psychology being built into your game I love the nature nurture chance thing I mean that chance part added to the bottom there just blew me away that was the very beginning of the podcast. I love the everything that you're building here. I think it's pretty cool. Um, the the next subject is probably incredibly boring, though. It sounds like the business part of getting it out to a community is 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 hardcore. How long has it has this process been going on? Where you've been the game is the game, but now you're working towards getting it into players' hands. Well, this is something you, you have to do parallel because if you first create the game and then start marketing it, you'll be too late. Then you'll have a beautiful product, uh, but if you announce it without marketing, nobody's going to hear it because you don't have a community. So yeah. we are building the community as we speak by being um, quite af active on Twitter, Instagram, uh, having our own web blog, doing some page on Facebook. So that's, I think, the least interesting platform to be active on. Um, we go to big conventions to promote the game. Uh, we, be we went to Spiel in Germany, which is the biggest European board game and role-playing game congress. Um, we'll be attending a GaryCon, uh, which I think is in March. Oh. Or... Cool. Where is GaryCon? Uh, is that in Washington? Oregon. Uh, Gary Con is in the vicinity of Milwaukee, I think. Oh, Milwaukee. Okay. For some reason, I thought it's he was Pacific Le Northwest. It's in, it's it's near Lake Geneva. Um, people say that Gary Con is kind of like Gen Con when it was upcoming. So we'll we'll have to see. Uh, we wanted, of course, also to go to that one, but timing wise, it's it it. It's going to be too late for our uh, Kickstarter uh, launch in uh, uh, 2019. So we'll oh, have really? to settle for. Wow. So you're close to the Kickstarter. When is that going to be kicking off? Um, what we would like to try is to have the Kickstarter live when we go to Game Expo UK, um, which I think is in May. So we would like to have the Kickstarter live in May. <sighs> That's exciting. That's that's right around the corner. Yeah. So again, we're not promising the community an exact date because we want to make sure that the game is really, really good. Because when we launch the Kickstarter, we want a, a playable uh, mini version of the game be available for our Kickstarter backers and for our community so they can try the game and experience it. And for this, the game needs to be absolutely well-balanced play-wise. <sighs> Yeah, you don't want anybody saying anything negative about it initially. You want them to be totally excited. Um, well, yes, but, but we also want to involve them in uh, gameplay balancing. So anybody that uh, is willing to endure an imperfect gameplay system will be able to sign up for playtesting the game and actually giving feedback. We want them then better. 
to break say the what they did not like and what could be better because if there's only the six of us keep playing the games we'll have blind spots um, yeah and also we the six of us are not a proper representation of the whole role-playing community so we need every role player out there to help us test this game so i mean what's the market look like for role-playing games right now it's it's an interesting one. Um, they do recently well on Kickstarter lately. Um, you, you see Kickstarter role-playing games going for, they say we want to raise $60,000 and then all of a sudden they raise like $400,000. Yeah, I've seen um, that a few times. Video games think, especially, right? Yeah. Um, and you know role-playing games i think it's fair to say that it's above average people that like to play them with an above average imagination because even if you have uh, a map and figurines uh, a lot of things still take place in the theater of the mind um so so you have you have an intelligent crowd that is creative which also means that they like to be uh they, they, they probably like variety. I mean, uh, probably if you are anything like me, at some point you will be just curious to try a new game because you're curious if it is going to give you something new. I was going to say people like that tend to be stodgy and sticking with what they like the best. Because, I mean, those are Star Wars fans too, right? And yes. they're not friendly to the new yeah. ones coming out. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, well, it's, it's a community of people that hard. want to be mad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just like the, there's many hardcore D and D players still paying three point five and claiming that five might not be good, even though probably they never played it. So yeah, I, I have never played it. I played five. I played four too. I, I just love. I love the. I love playing these type of games. I mean, it doesn't matter really to me what the rules are. I mean, because the guy sitting in front of me is making up the rules. You know what I mean? Yeah. That DM is the one that's the rule maker. I mean, the books might say something different, but ultimately that guy's the one that makes the decision. And yeah, so this, you know, if you're selling to me, the player, I'm not the one that's probably going to run a game. That guy who's going to run the game is the one that you're selling to. Ultimately, that, I mean, in my experience, the DMs are the ones with all the books, all the toys, all the dice, all the minis, all the rules, all the campaign, uh, you know, uh, campaigns. It's like those those dudes are the ones that spend the money. And they're yeah, so. Absolutely. I mean, what do they call them? Gracknox? What's that term? <laughs> is that I have never heard that term. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a term for somebody who basically just is very stodgy in their beliefs in role playing games. They refuse to bend. I mean, they don't like Dungeons and Dragons five, or four, or four point five, or whatever, because of this there reason or that reason. There's definitely one in every party, right? I'm sure the purest. Yes. Yes. But I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you. I love new worlds. I love exploring them. Um, in a significant way. Uh, right. yeah. yeah, so it's it's hard to get into. I'm really, I've been watching your tweets. I don't know how I started following you. So that's interesting too, how it kind of happens like that. Um, I mean, what's next for you? I know you have cons coming up. You're doing the Kickstarter, but more immediate, you're done with the writing and the game developing or you're actually looking for um, testers? Well, a lot is in process. <laughs> Um, we're, we're not yet looking to testers. We are now in our third internal um, playtest rounds. Uh, basically, when, when we feel internally that we have a well-playable, balanced game, that's when we're going to do closed beta tests, where we invite people in the Netherlands over to come to our office and actually um, while we observe them playing it, because that's also going to tell us a lot. Um, and after these play uh, tests have been done, which we would like to schedule somewhere probably in January or February, that's when we'll open it up uh, in an open beta where we will have a small um, PDF downloadable for everybody that wants to play test it. Uh, at the same time, we are very close to finishing the worlds, but not a hundred percent there yet we finished far haven the fancy world the fancy races they're all finished we finished the geography we finished the factions we finished uh the religions uh and most of the magic system the same goes for victoria sleeping dragon is the last world to be fully fleshed out we fleshed out most of the things but the geography is still a mystery to us and we need to get that right because 
you know, with the fancy world and the steampunk world, you can say this is the known world. The rest has not been discovered. But if you have a science fiction world with satellites orbiting the world, the whole world is known. We cannot give them a full... The whole world, the whole solar system, most of the known universe, right? The How the universe yes. started. I mean, the science fiction world yes. has... If it's right or wrong, they have an idea about it. You know what I mean? They probably had d- dissenting ideas and fights and wars happening over those ideas. Yeah, but they know everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then there's there's yeah. So so there's that. So we still need to do a lot of work on the world of Sleeping Dragon, uh, and once Sleeping Dragon is um, uh, finished, I mean we started writing the Far Haven core book. Um, and the Far Haven core book is going to be a template for the Victoria and the Sleeping Dragon core book. Uh, I expect that definitely to still take one or two months before we are fully finished with the first draft of that one and then it needs to be corrected and double checked and triple checked and then probably we'll have some rule changes from the playtest and we'll have to amend the rules in the book. Um, then at the same time we want to produce a limited edition that contains all three worlds including the rules on how to travel from one world to the other world oh that's um, cool so you're going to give them an opportunity to buy the three separate worlds the ones that most yes. interest them then there's going to be a fourth option of all three worlds together yes fantastic yes and then probably once the game is out there we will at some point open up a website where you can submit your own worlds and if the worlds are properly balanced and properly written lore wise they can become canon if we think they're awesome so i mean i again i really appreciate you hanging out with me and and talking i think we started a little bit late but um i like to end the podcast with a few questions um the first being this has been a journey two years you're ever however old you are since eight years old starting playing these games what has been the most surprising part of it for you coming to this Uh, point um i get so much energy from creating this game with the team i have i have created games with different teams and it cannot always be it, it is not always um an easygoing ride because wherever there's people there is uh, opinions and wherever there's opinions there's strife um <laughs> but we really have an awesome team and every i mean i find myself going to work on aether void when i'm sick because i just want to go to work for it i find myself going to work next week uh on this because i want to work for it but it's actually technically a holiday because of the christmas season uh-huh. um and it's the first time ever that I actually notice I want to go to work. I want to work with these guys. That's so cool. That's yes. so cool. I mean, I can imagine ego being a devastating blow to productivity. You know what I mean? This guy's got to have this because for whatever reason, and this guy doesn't want it because of whatever reason. And I mean, if you can get six people to avoid that or talk through it, I mean, that's an amazing experience. Yeah, I um, think the biggest ego in, in the room is probably mine. So sometimes I'm worried I'm not being the, the you know, the the, <laughs> the the asshole, pardon my French. Uh, <laughs> so but that's yeah. the thing, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, you have to have somebody who's not just bending to everybody's will, whim either. I mean, you have to have somebody kind of saying this is the vision. But, hey, let's add some spice to it. What do you got? Um, I mean, yeah. where you are right now compared to where you started, is this the vision that you thought you'd end up with or is it a totally different situation, different game? It's very, very close to what we envisioned. Yes. Really? We had to kill some tiny darlings. But yeah, because um, my, well, my co-founder and myself, we are both very experienced role players. So we really kind of knew what we wanted. We were very much on the same page with it. And uh, we found a really awesome team when we basically already set up the basic premise of the game and they loved it. So they wanted to attach to us, which made us from a two person team to a six person team. Um, And it turns out that most of what we designed is working really well. So yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, Yeah, my next question would be what's been the hardest part? this process yeah oh i mean just creating in general for you as a creator as an artist as somebody who's making stories and world i mean what's the hardest part i mean that's not even let's take the game out of it i mean when you create something what is the hardest thing that you come up against 
I think in the end, um, even though I think we're doing a great job, I think the marketing of this game is going to be the hardest part because in in such a big world with such a variety of awesome and interesting products to play and to read and to watch, we really have to let our voice be heard, make sure that people know that we're making this. Otherwise, if they don't know it exists, it can be the most awesome game on the planet, but nobody's going to buy it because they never heard of it. They'll bite you though, won't they? I mean, that's what I've noticed a lot lately is that they buy the creator and the product that the creator is creating. Yeah. I mean, you just yeah. see these creators becoming huge. Just as a big, big, giant example, George Lucas, right? I mean, he's you can't pull him away from Star Wars. That's what his, that's what he did for humanity. I mean, they yeah. love George Lucas. They hate George Lucas, whatever have you. I mean, there are people like that associated with these projects. Gary Gygax. I mean, there's another example. They love Gary Gygax. They hate him, whatever have you. Yeah. D&D is... Yeah. his baby <laughs> yeah it, I mean, it would not have been without these people there would be no star wars without lucas there wouldn't be a dnd well maybe there would be, have been a star wars and a dnd without uh, these people but would it have been the same i don't think so i don't think so and they're part of that that legacy right i mean i don't know whether you're aiming for something like that or not but it seems like the narrative of the team the narrative of the creator becomes kind of a monster on its, all on its own or an animal all on its own part well, of the method. And, and this is a weird thing i mean if you end up in the spotlight for whatever reason for creating a great book or for creating great film um everybody will have an opinion about you and it's very very easy to have an opinion about what shit decisions you made on a prequel or on a sequel or whatnot um but most people have never ever decided to get out of their comfort zone and try to do something really 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 big i mean we we might feel with aether void at some point maybe with the kickstarter maybe the kickstarter fails you know because maybe the people feel like eh, aether void it's nice but nah. uh, and and maybe we'll fall flat on our face and we'll never be famous with it and we'll never reach mass sales but we are going to aim for for the stars and hopefully hit the moon we're going to try and get many many thousands of players hooked to our game so we get a big big community and if we feel at least we can say we tried and then everybody can have yeah. an opinion about it that's but you can about. build on that too can't you you can build on that i had tried i mean it's not like i tried yeah. and you fell flat on your face and you gotta be a garbage man or something you failed uh, you, you fell on your face you get up you have all the experience that you just learned to ride into the oh. next project this is very true because people tend to see success as something that just happens to people. Happens. They tend to see somebody like, oh, they became successful overnight with this film. And what they don't see is that a filmmaker might have made 20 movies before that, most of them perhaps even really, really shit. Um, but, <laughs> you know... Um, uh, they don't yeah. see that. They haven't seen the struggles of the person getting to where they are because it's no easy. Success is not an easy achievement. It doesn't fall into anyone's lap. There is Even Martin Scorsese, that. if you take him as like the, feel, the, the film example, I mean, the guy might make a film a year or a film every two years, but you're not seeing all the projects that he has his heart set on making that don't work out. Yeah. I mean, just because he's Martin Scorsese doesn't mean like every script that he tries to give producers or a studio is going to be made and he'll get millions and millions of dollars for it. He falls flat on his ass. And the sad thing is, the worst part about it is sometimes the project that you end up making that's out there in the world is not the project that you really wanted to make, but you were kind of stuck making it because you had made promises for other things. You know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating world that we live in. I mean, you never know when your success is going to come or what it's going to look like when it actually gets here. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, my last question for you, man, is uh, what are you consuming right now? Like you would suggest other people check out video games, movies, television, books, especially. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I'm well, yeah, what am I consuming at the moment? I'm currently reading uh, all the books by Raymond Feist. Uh, I never got around to reading them. So Who's Raymond I'm Feist? Yeah, so it's the Rift War saga, or the Rift War... Um, what, have you read him? No, I haven't. I don't oh, think so, anyway. I'm really bad with names, though. I'm one of those dudes that'll rifle a... through, like, a discount bin and just take something that looks interesting, read it, and never <laughs> hear about the author's name or where it came from. Well, his his books are very interesting. The, the, the old thing... Wise, they they it feels like reading a story set in a D and D world, but then it's not, and that's probably because they were role players when the writer started uh, writing the books. 
Um, but he also did some books together, together with, I think, Jenny Wirtz, um, if I pronounce her name right, um, which are really, really, really good. I, I, it's, they, those are very captivating, so I can't really get much sleep these days because I want to keep reading. Um, so I can recommend those. Um, when it comes down to film and television, uh, yeah, what am I watching at the moment? <laughs> We're actually watching uh, something called Merlin, which is a BBC series, a British series. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with it. It's a little bit older, right? Like, it's not playing anymore. Yeah, it's it's not on the air anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's like, that's it's, an archetype, right? And that Merlin thing has been around. The King Arthur, yeah. that's one of the first fantasy stories with magic and Beowulf. I mean, these are these herbal and uh, these herbal traditions. These these verbal traditions passing these stories <laughs> along. Uh, yeah. We don't have, we don't have that so, anymore, are we? I mean, that's, there's very few of those. True. So, so Merlin is not the most brilliant series ever, um, <laughs> but it is still entertaining in its own ways. Uh, I'm also uh, in my spare time watching something really, really bad, but I kind of really, really like it. It's a really big guilty pleasure. It's called A Korean Odyssey. It Korean is a Odyssey? Series, uh, <laughs> yeah, A Korean Odyssey. It's about a girl that can see ghosts and she grows up to be a real estate. Or, um, and it in a way it's so bad it's good it's okay <laughs> uh, i'm ashamed to admit i'm watching it but i am watching it um it's got a bunch so, of seasons yeah yeah but uh, uh when yeah what am i consuming i, I mean can I tell you my all-time uh, favorite film is the original blade runner i think still what'd you think of 2049 um, what'd you think of the embarrassing things i I haven't watched it yet. You haven't watched it. Um, when it was in the cinemas, we wanted to watch it, but we, uh, our whole family was down with the flu. And by the time the flu was done, the movie wasn't in the cinemas anymore over here. And uh, I really want to watch it on a big screen. So I kind of refused. Oh, man. You're going to probably be waiting a long time. I don't know if they'll count this one as a classic or not. It would be nice if they kind of had them back and uh, back back to back. You could watch one and then right into the next yeah. one, double feature type situation. I'd recommend it. Yeah, I did please. see it in the movie theater. I thought it was a really yeah. wonderful movie. I thought it was really well done. I think I'm really going to like it because I am starting more and more to crave films that have a sort of a My longer... phone is going off. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you know, the, the, the the pace of the first Blade Runner film was really good, and I heard they really have a nice slow pace again in the second Blade Runner one, um, where they have really the, the really the atmosphere going, and that's what, I, what I long for. Really, really loved it. Like long, lingering shots. It's kind of like a western with technology. You know the 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 questions that it's kind of raising about individuality and consciousness and things like that are there you know for the longest time blade runner was a movie that i had seen over and over and over again like everybody else i'm a child of the yeah. 80s i mean that movie was like we'd watch it over and over and over again but my entire life i never thought i finished watching it i always thought i fell asleep at the end or something and never saw the end of blade runner <laughs> and i watched oh my god my phone's going crazy again um Okay, That's that might be about true. my kids. Um, what was I gonna say? I never saw the I never saw the end of it until just recently realized that the end of it was the guy kind of dying on the roof and staying still and and whatever questions that rose. I was like, wow, I had watched that movie many many times and not realized it. Um, I need to uh, call these people back. Unfortunately, that might be about one of my children. Um, hopefully everything is okay because I called twice in a row. But I really really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much for volunteering to be uh, on the show today. And uh, please, please I'm going to keep uh, an eye out on your Twitter, but if I don't retweet stuff involving your game, definitely hit me up with links and whatnot, and I'll send it out. Not that it does anything to anybody, but yeah. Um, and uh, as far as when this show will be published, uh, I'm getting on it, but I'm not quite sure, but I'll let you know as soon as it does. All right. Thank you. Thank you, man. You have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.